I'd like to ask our other three panelists to please come up and uh, join us up here. That was a wonderful introduction to the nature of identity and character out there in this uh, strange space. Um, for, the, for the rest of this panel, I'd like us to suspend some of our assumptions. Um, let me give you an example. I have a, an aunt who lives in Aurora. She's a retired nun, which I think is an oxymoron. Um, but she, uh, I call her every so often, and uh, I call her up and I say, Hi, Aunt Jen, how are you? And she says, I'm fine, your grandmother's fine, bye. And somewhere buried back in her limbic system, she thinks that long distance calling is really, really expensive. And she doesn't know that the last time I picked up a pen and hand wrote a letter to somebody was a very, very long time ago. And that I don't mind spending two hours on the phone with friends in California. So part of what we're going to talk about is online presence and so forth. But, but I ask you not to limit your ideas to the current state of the art of online services or even muds and moos or even the cable TV system or whatever else. Uh, imagine a world where there's a lot more uh, communications bandwidth, but the problems that exist in this space still need to be worked out. And they're problems of identity and they're problems of space. What do spaces look like? Uh, when you can play with the space and the dimensions of it, uh, what is that like? What, what happens in these spaces and why are, they, why are they popular? And can they affect things like loyalty? Can they create affiliations between people or between people and companies and how are they useful in that way? So I'd like to open by um, asking Carol Peters, who's the co-founder of Da Vinci Time and Space, a company that is presently developing uh, interesting ways of, of creating new times and spaces for kids between 3 and 12, um, to talk a little bit about the, the, the line between reality and virtuality and uh, the idea of, of presence and identity, how, that, how you see that evolving. Well, I, it's such an enormous question, and, and I'm still really quite affected by Sherry's talk, which, which I think was wonderful in the context of this. Um, the way that we think about this, the way that I and the people at my company think about this is that um, we're building this thing which we've chosen to call a time and a space. It's very definitely a virtual world. Um, it could be called a follow-on to the idea of a textual mud or a move. But the difference is that, that we've come at it entirely from the television metaphor. and. I think the fundamental point here about the television metaphor versus the computer metaphor is that the tele television metaphor is a metaphor populated almost entirely by personalities or celebrities who are experiencing uh, or presenting both to themselves, to their compatriots on screen and to the audience out there. They're presenting a semblance of life and life is the fundamental difference. The computer for all the wonderfulness of its environment is it's a dead space. It's a space where there's a lot, of, a lot of tools and you can do things with those tools, part of which happens to be, thanks to the internet, the ability to talk to people. But the actual uh, metaphor that a computer uses is, is kind of a dead space. And the difference between a, a, what we're doing and what a lot of other people are doing and what moos and muds are like is that these are virtual spaces in which personalities, both large and small, exist, and in which time passes. And so that's, that's to me, this, this very fundamental thing that makes it entirely different from computers and, in fact, makes it a semblance of another life, or as I call it another reality. I mean, I often say to people in my company, what we're in the business of is reality creation, and that the reality we create is as valid as the reality that that you experience as RL. Now that's a huge leap of faith because in fact, uh, building a space like this, a mud or a moo, in text or on television, the phenomenon of it is you can't understand as the creator of it what it is until the participants arrive. And particularly in the construction of a television-based virtual time and space, um, you have to spend two to three years creating it because of the production issues and the design issues and the story issues and the new personality celebrity issues, the ones that you create, but you can't understand anything of its behavior until the audience that it reaches becomes large enough so that the emergent behavior between the virtual space and the other participants, the voluntary participants, starts to be its own reality. And that's the reality that in fact is the most interesting. 
So the space uh, effectively becomes an ecosystem of sorts and isn't really, it needs to reach some form of critical mass with participants um, and then it takes on a life of its own and, and some issues, a lot of issues may be out of your control. Um, Stuart, Stuart Brand, who is with Global Business Network and, and many other uh, affiliations, was one of the people who started the well, the Whole Earth Electronic Link in Sausalito, California and virtually everywhere. And uh, I'm wondering if you've, if you've come to any thoughts about what, what a good starter kit is for these kinds of communities, for, for these sorts of ecologies or whatever. It's, uh, it's pretty hard to create an ecology, yet they tend to regenerate themselves. And there's a whole lot of thinking going on in this area and, and at Santa Fe Institute and many other places. Uh, is there some set of things you could suggest to somebody to put together that helps spark this kind of life form? I think the, the fundamental realization here is, is uh, actually comes from uh, a moo experience, the Lambda Moo at Xerox Park inspired Pavel Curtis to uh, say that the killer application in the 90s is people. <laughs> and what I've heard so far at this conference is, hey, the killer application in the 90s is transactions. <laughs> and it'll probably be transactions and people. But people got there first. There's been 25 years of net behavior where the transactions were basically social. And money transactions are now going to be mapped on top of that existing very strong reality. So when we started the well, uh, which is a, just a little teleconference system based in California, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, 1984, I had been on a system called EYES for a couple of years and seen things that went very well and not so well on EYES. And one of the things I wanted to be sure of is kind of the opposite of, of what Sherry was reporting with, with Moos. I wanted to be sure that people online had a kind of accountability, that accountability was essential because I had seen people behaving anonymously on EYES in very destructive ways. And so the ways that, that we sort of built in, designed in accountability at the well was, um, you asked who we started with, we started with hackers and journalists. And it turns out giving free accounts to journalists, uh, that was our entire marketing strategy, actually. It's sort of like giving <laughs> drugs to a drug addict in a way. That worked fine. Uh, we got more ink than anybody for years and years. Uh, but the way we managed accountability was by stating it was a regional teleconference system. It was based in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area, and I was just uh, asking uh, the current owner, uh, Bruce Cates, what the, dis what the range of the 11,000 people or so now in the well is, and half of them are in California, half elsewhere, about 10% overseas. Uh, initially, it was primarily Northern California and Bay Area, and the reason for that is that bodies were connected. Uh, unlike on CompuServe or then the source and places like that where people could get pretty irresponsible because there was no body anywhere in, uh, in imaginary space you could get back and sock in the nose for being such a dope. Uh, there was the face-to-face -face option and it built right into the well. Uh, another way we, we managed accountability and <laughs> liability really and from our standpoint was to say at the beginning to everybody who came on, and it's still there when you log into the well, you own your own words. In other words, we're not responsible for the stuff you say. Nobody's going to sue the well for you being uh, libelous online. That then got over-translated into, I can get money for my own words, which turned out to be a complete delusion. Uh, and then we also, the software called PicoSpan, this kind of half-baked software, which was so half-baked, the other people that we, as I said, brought in were hackers early on. That was to help finish the program and help defend it. Uh, it gave us the choice of, of people's login identity, login ID, being either attached to their postings uh, or not. And the decision I made was that their login ID would always be attached to their postings, no matter what and that then they could, they could throw on fictional or, or sort of uh, interactional handle type names, but you would always know that JRC is John Carroll, who happens to be a columnist in the San Francisco Chron or Chronicle, or HLR is, is Howard Rheingold, or SBB is Stuart Brand. And again, uh, when someone 
was behaving really irresponsibly, there was an identifiable, accountable person behind that you could go back and nail. Uh, and to sort of make the point, uh, nail it on anonymity, people said, well, you know, there's some stuff that people want to talk about in kind of whistle-blowing whistle mode, or they want to talk about really private stuff that they'd rather not be identified with. Can't we have a place on the well where people can be anonymous and make anonymous postings? And indeed, as it was uh, written up in Release 1.0, we tried that uh, because the software allowed it, and it was a hideous failure. It was a very really educational fa failure. I'm glad we tried it, and it would be probably worth trying again in various forms. Uh, but it was a failure because people who, because it was a community now, because of these other things, they started impersonating each other. And it is astonishing how rapidly destructive it is when people, uh, you know, if Dr. Sherry on your, your mud had been believed by everybody to be you, that could mess up your life in interesting ways. And since the, the mud and moose are, are accepted as fictional domains, that's one thing. The well is not a fictional domain. And when people started fictionally impersonating each other, it was dreadful. And that was just shut down. Uh, Adam, Adam Curry was a VJ with MTV for, I guess, uh, seven years and uh, then decided that he understood what was going on in the technological realm uh, pretty well and that could pro he could probably have more of an effect helping move that forward in interesting ways than sort of being a celebrity on TV. Mm -hmm. So he's uh, started a company called OnRamp and several other uh, entities and is doing some really fascinating work pushing <coughs> the infrastructure in interesting new directions. So OnRamp is in the business of creating commercial spaces for various companies, including Reebok and others. Uh, but part of what Adam is doing is helping build communities, not TV broadcast advertising channels, but places. And I, I was hoping you could elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah, first of all, um, I'd, I'd like to say that I was uh, I'm kind of bummed that Sherry did not turn out to be Dr. Sherry, because I was really excited about finally being the person I had great sex with on Lambda Moo. <laughs> <laughs> Can't win them all. Um, if, if you really want to know, first of all, if you want to know what uh, the internet could be, there's a great book, it was on the bestseller list, so I know that a lot of you have read it, by Neil Stevenson called Snow Crash. And the technology that we have today is not quite up to par so that we can live that way where you put on a, uh, a headset, it's, uh, there's an infrared transmitter to your computer, you're jacked into the net, you have what's called an avatar, uh, which is a rendering of what you look like, you determine what you look like, you conduct business, you uh, have relationships over what is the, uh, known as the metaverse there, uh, what is uh, uh, Neil Stevenson's version of the internet, and the only uh, people on the street in RL are um, Federal Express couriers and Domino's Pizza, who won the franchise wars. Um, so that is truly the Bible, I think, of, uh, of what we're talking about. If you have a chance, go out and read that book. What we're trying to do is, you know, as you say, create virtual communities. How do you do that? I truly believe it's tools. You give people the tools. You maybe give them a little spark of, you know, let's, let's talk about this. For instance, um, we built PlanetReebok.com. Now, uh, the interesting thing is you cannot buy a shoe off of Reebok's domain. That was not the point. It was not, a, you know, not the point to, to be another retail outlet, but to create a community. And Reebok really has a lot of interesting things. They've got sports celebrities. They've got um, coaches. They're uh, involved in human rights now. Um, they literally gave us their logo and said, build me a community. Um, and we did that. And now there's people online uh, chatting um, back and forth, talking about, lo and behold, sneakers. You know, and they really get into it. Do my sneakers have feelings? And you know, people go back and forth. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. It's 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 really happening. Now, where we are today is that text is a very very powerful tool. I mean, it's when you read a book, you get a, a visualization of of what the author intended or what he thought. You have your own your own view of that. That's the same with the mud. It's a text version. Uh, when when a snowball rolls in, rolls into the room, uh, the top pops open, and uh, a voice says, you know, all aboard who are going to the snowball room, I have my own vision, everybody here will have their own separate vision of what that snowball looked like outside on the inside. Um, people like Knowledge Adventures, who I think are doing some interesting things, 
are not there yet for a visualization of that. It is, it is, we just technically are not there yet um, where it goes fast enough, where the, there's enough imagination um, that you can really visualize what is happening. And um, you know, therefore, as, I mean, Sherry really summed it up beautifully that <clears throat> the MUDs or um, we have the multi-user dimensions, you know, the, the moves. My favorite is the multi-user shared hallucination. I, you know, I'd like to take it just a little bit further. Um, you know, that's, that truly is where communities are being built. So what you need to do is have a theme. Most MUDs have a theme um, or, or have a strong presence of people who create a theme. Give them that and the rest builds itself automatically. And I, I really like the statement that, the, you know, the killer app of the 90s is people. I mean, <laughs> that's definitely it. How, how involved have Reebok people been in Planet Reebok? Um, they really took a lot of our recommendations and have created their own presence on the back end. Uh, you, there's so many companies now, it's like a checklist, you know, let's throw up a shingle in cyberspace, you know, gee, we're Zima, you know, we, we got to be there, you know, okay, great. Um, but that's, you know, you go there once and like, uh, okay, you know, I've, I've seen this thing that I probably never drink anyway, or maybe I will. Um, but what, you know, what's behind it? Well, answer is nothing, you know, because there's just some CEO or someone who's a, you, unfortunately usually an, an information services person, you know, it's like, well, we set up the LAN, we're on the web, chick, 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 okay, we're there. Um, Reebok, you can actually talk to Lou Holtz. Um, you can talk to uh, people in marketing. Uh, there were great postings on the bulletin board. Um, you know, you guys are involved in human rights, so how much do you pay your, uh, your workers in the Far East? They responded within two hours, and that's what it's about. That's really, you know, they're online, and they're, I mean, they're not a fictional character, but they are a real presence. And I think and a, a shiver just went through the spine of every PR person in this room. And that's good. That's good. It's the way it should be. Exactly. Um, oh, thank you. I, I'd, like to, I'd like to circle back to um, some of the stuff we started with, both about celebrities and personalities and character and identity. Um, Bob, are the people that you're speaking with um, uh, as sort of tuned in to these kinds of dynamics uh, as it seems like this panel is? And are they eager and anxious to participate, or does this sort of scare the hell out of them and they think they see their revenue streams going away and their, uh, uh, the rest of their business? Um, I, first, I found Sherry's comments um, uh, very provocative and um, surprising to the extent that uh, there is real work going on um, to build business plans and actually launch business plans in 95 where shows would be on uh, the services. And I use the word shows um, um, on purpose um, so that um, you know at 7 o'clock a particular uh, show comes on and you could do one of two things. You could sit and observe the show and the dialogue on the show or you can participate in the show. Now. Uh, I'm not a social scientist, but I think the difference between what Sherry was talking about and what I'm seeing in terms of business plans is that there are boundary conditions. It is clearly fiction. There is no crossover on the line. It's clearly um, uh, fantasy, but it gives people permission to create character and um, move into uh, their transitional period. Um, and yet, um, it has to stay in, in some boundaries so it doesn't under, undermine the show. Some of the most creative people that I have met in the last year are working in this very area um, and looking to make their careers in hosting and creating personality around that show and characters around the show that we could then interact with or observe. What happens when, uh, for example, when the web started getting hot, there was a fellow named Scott Yanoff who put together in, an interesting places list that originally was just tech stuff, and it became known as Yanoff's list. And you would go there to check for new things, and I had never heard of Scott Yanoff in my life. But he became a character in my life. And then I, I, at some point I started getting Adam Curry's Cyber Sleaze report. And, and I'm sorry, I, I didn't know who Adam Curry was. But I started getting this, this really amusing thing, and, and after a while, if, if Adam had pointed to something, I would have probably followed that link and gone and checked things out. Um, if you have a, a sort of a, a stable of talent under contract, and yet somebody who's outside 
um, becomes a, an attention getter and becomes a magnet for activity that affects you and involves you, what kind of role do you play? How do you, how do you uh, deal with that? We'll probably put them under contract and Sign take 10%. <laughs> Come on in. Uh, it will happen. Uh, Sherry? Uh, I just wanted to point out that um, I'm not a, I like to say that p people often ask me, am I talking about mudding or using virtual reality as a kind of psychotherapy? And in a way I am and in a way I'm not. I, I like to say that mudding is most psychotherapeutic for people who are also in psychotherapy. And by that I mean that people create characters, they have experiences, they get involved with situations. For some people, it's just, you know, what a therapist would call a kind of acting out. It's just doing actions, but not, not being able to metabolize them in a way that really is kind of growth building for the person. For other people, it's more what therapists call a working through. That is, they really work through some set of issues that are very helpful to them in their RL. The reason I, I bring this up is that central to being able to do that is the creation of one's own character and some degree of control so that the introvert can play the extrovert if that's what he yeah. or she needs to do mm -hmm. and so forth. So I just want to say that I'm a little bit concerned that some of these um, the phenomena that I'm seeing are very dependent on the person themselves being able to create some significant dimension of that character as opposed to there being some set of characters in the show that you can play. I'm sure that the market is going to force the situation to have just the right amount, or there'll be a variety of things, but you know, the right amount of the person doing what they need to do versus the professionals creating a, a sort of seamless uh, production. Stuart? Sorry. Um, the question of stars online, which uh, clearly will be happening uh, increasingly. When it's truly interactive, some um, sometimes uncomfortable things happen. When the, if you have a famous person online, like yourself, if they are online a lot, like Howard Rheingold, who's on three hours a day, seven days a week, uh, it's completely comfortable that uh, a famous person happens to be talking to a lot of people who aren't famous yet. And that's fine. When you have a famous visitor to a domain where people have been online a lot, as for example, on the Well in the Generation X conference, they were talking a lot about this book called Generations, and someone invited one of the authors of Generations on. And he came on and was a really bright, active, interesting person who had all kinds of, I thought, fascinating information. But he was flamed right to death, and after uh, about a week of putting up with it, disappeared and was never seen again. Uh, this is another reason, by the way, I'm in favor of accountability in these kinds of, of uh, forums because the more you have accountability, the, the, the likelier that flaming will uh, not occur, but it will. And I don't know exactly the, the solution to that problem yet. Various people have tried uh, you know, putting a remove so that the question, the, the famous person only hears polite questions approach, but that's a little limited. Um, Laurie Anderson, I saw, was backstage at her show a couple of nights ago, and, and um, somebody put her online because they were filming her in relation to cyberspace for Discovery Channel program. And she was on with you know, five or six other people, one of whom had already said that they were Laurie. And uh, so the entire discussion was uh, not interesting interaction with Laurie Anderson, who is an astoundingly interesting woman in intelligence, uh, it was, you know, who's the real Laurie Anderson? What a bore. A Turing test for Laurie Anderson. A uh, Turing test for Laurie Anderson. You know, how would you like to prove you're really yourself? <laughs> well, this, this, also, this also points out another aspect. Uh, you talked about working through. There's also acting out that happens online. And uh, things go out of control really quickly. Uh, Adam, I don't know if you're going to talk about... Well, I, I was just going to say being, you know, you say famous person. I'll tell you in the showbiz ladder, VJs are really down at that bottom rung. Um, but... When I first really went online and, and open, I mean, it's, it's very difficult when you walk down the street or you're in the, in the mall or, you know, you're eating and people come up to you. It, you know, it's uncomfortable. You know, I'm with my family. I just don't want to be bothered. Um, and that's where you get that star aura. When you're online, you know, that is gone. It's, it's not there. That, that invisible force field, you know, you, you see Eddie Murphy walk down the street. like, wow, you know, there's Eddie. You can't touch him. 
Um, that is completely re completely removed. What I did see in the beginning uh, certainly was you know people thinking that was you know a dumb blonde. <laughs> you know, it can be male or female, obviously, um, and that went away once you you you, know, you talk to people and they'll really open up to you. Um, but your, your point is well made about the impersonation of, of people. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you can really show your true colors. Billy Idol you know, said, hey, I'm a cyberpunk, <laughs> called this album Cyberpunk, did a cyberpunk video, and you know, did he ever really read his mail? You know, I think he had a well account. Uh, <laughs> you know, but no, he didn't. And, and people saw through that and said, you know, forget about it, man, you, you're not for real. Uh, but I, you know, going back to Scott Yanoff, you know, sure, the, the the stars of the net are on the net. Then, you know, I don't think it's a question of coming from outside. We don't need to right. take existing content, existing um, celebrities, and put them in cyberspace. They have to come from the roots up. And and they participate over time. Carol, um, I want to touch on another thing Sherry alluded to, which has to do with whether you're talking about a virtual space in which reality, some kind of something highly resembling reality occurs, which is what you're talking about. I mean, Billy Idol's a real person. And, and the other possibility, which I think Bob was a little closer to, which is the idea that you would create some kind of a virtual place that's fundamentally a fictional place, but it's a fictional place that's authored, I'm, I might say, at least perhaps in a dominating sense, but at least in a leading the string sense by a set of people for whom that is their specialty. In other words, if you have an entirely creative writer, artist, author, actor, and the, the virtual place carries the thread of a story that has been created by that artist or that team of artists, and then within that space, the participation of the viewers is in fact highly with relation to the story that's ongoing, but also secondarily entirely in relation to the viewers as they interact with each other, sometimes commenting on the story and sometimes not at all. That's actually a very different kind of virtual reality or virtual place than the well is. And, and I think that, well, that's certainly the sort of corner of it that we're aiming at, and I think that's where a lot of the real talent community is going to contribute because of your earlier remark. They are extraordinarily creative, intelligent people with story creation capability or character creation capability or both and that as a dominant theme changes the nature of the place that you're creating um, I'd be interested in any of your view on on this but we've been studying talk radio um, and we really bumped into it because it seems that that um, has many of the attributes you know that we're talking about where there is personality and yet um, you know people have a permission, maybe to say things on talk radio that they wouldn't say uh, face to face. Is that is that a precursor That's to what we're talking about? I once about? did. I once did a study. Let me show you how what you associate to. I did a study of the home shopping networks and uh, the religious call-in programs on both of these. On all of talk radio and those two mm -hmm. television situations are ones where people call up and give testimonials about the products that are actually being sold, and they have permission in those settings to talk about their families and their diamondique and how changing wearing their diamondique, mm -hmm. diamondique for those of you who don't watch home shopping, <laughs> is a is a diamond-like <laughs> substance. <laughs> Honest. Called class. But not diamond. Don't laugh. They make a lot of money. Yeah. Diamondique is a big thing, and people, mm. you know, call in and talk about it. And through talking about the products, actually do adopt different kinds of personas in relation to them. Similarly, on uh, things like PTL and 700 Club, when people call in, and mm -hmm. there's a similar sort of. I, I think of them as spaces that are kind of on the margins, of, as being both in the real and outside of the real. And I actually think that, I mean, that it's the tension between spaces that are just enough in the real, yeah. with just enough permeability to the real, um, that the real action and the real compelling holding power of this medium takes place. I think there's going to be a lot of exciting things and kind of, I'm waiting to play, you know, Scarlett O'Hara and Gone with the Wind my right. whole life. I'm ready. I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm, but the casting um, call in the morning. <laughs> but um, but but I think that the most evocative, uh, fr from my point of view, where people are trying to work through these things, are going to come in places where there's that kind of creative tension 
between what's real and what's not, what's RL. Because please, even please come up to the microphone with your questions. Yeah. You Jerry, I want to add one more thing to it. Another factor here that really changes the dynamic of what's going on. The difference between what you can do in a virtual space where it's networked and therefore there's a large number of people, and by the way, every single individual person is having their own experience, which is, you know, by some percentage factor different from everyone else's experience at that exact moment in time says that you're creating an environment in which there is no there is no central conversation there may be a central theme or story but it's it's a uh, it's controlled by a vast number of people or kids in our case it's not like a talk radio show or ptl where there really is one person to whom the things right. flow in and then the you know the sort of pattern is evoked the a virtual space is one in which many patterns occur and happen simultaneously, and that's a different form. So it's not the Rush Limbaugh virtual right. space. Right. Adam? I hope everybody heard what Sherry just said about Home Shopping Club. Very important point. Jim Clark, pay attention as well. The reason why that is so successful, you know, QVC, is because it's usually blue-haired ladies sitting at home, nothing to do. They're a member of a club. They're hanging out. They love to talk to Jim. Hey, you know, I picked up on that item that you had on uh, last night. Oh, too bad it was sold out. That's the success. It's not just a matter of, oh, I can transmit my credit card information securely. Very good point. It's both the 15, min 15 minutes of fame aspect and also that this is the safest call you will ever make to have that opportunity to be on the air. This host wants you to shine. Yep. They absolutely want you to be the best person in the universe and the best spokesperson for their, for their uh, thing. I saw, I think, two Marks show up at the microphone early. Um, Mark Pesci, please. Yes, hi. Um, I have a question. Communities, are, they're, they're not ephemeral. They have a history. They're persistent. What do we need to put into our communities when we're bringing them into the virtual realm to provide mythology and memory so that they have a continuity associated with them? And what have you learned about that? And finally, we have to keep in mind that all of the pathology that's present in real space is present in cyberspace. And what do we need to do, and I think, Carol, you're probably most concerned about this, to prevent that from happening. Well, I'll give two quick answers, but I'm sure many people have things to say. Um, persistence and two items. One is, per, well, three. One is persistence, one is acquisition, and one is creativity. Those are three dominant themes in the development of our programming because, you know, we build a time and space, and time is real time passes. It starts the first time a kid ever shows up and it, you know, it proceeds forward and it is consistent. Um, so within that, um, the kid is able to, in fact, develop their own, you called it mythology. We have huge arguments about cosmology versus mythology, etc. But um, the point is that a kid within the space discovers a persistent and enduring reality and passage of time. They are able to acquire and collect things or looks or aspects that remain unless they actively change them. And then thirdly, they are able to be creative. They not only can be in the space and see what happens and communicate with a community of other kids, they also can create things and then do the things with their creations that people normally do, like sharing them or hiding them or, you know, et cetera. So incredibly important. I think the other thing about us, of course, is since we do kids only, um, safety is a dominant and important factor, and so anonymity is not allowed. And we use our software architecture that, of course, underlies on uh, all of this, not only to monitor and implement the persistence and acquisition and creativity things, but um, we know always who a kid is, and we know how kids relate, and we have a whole structure I don't really want to talk about having to do with how the kids are living, so to speak, um, within a safe space, because that is, in fact, the enabling factor that allows them to discover and grow within that environment. Stuart? I think it's a great question that, that communities really require some memory of their own uh, activities in the past. And one that we've seen in the well is people. Uh, there are some people who become pillars of the community. I mentioned Howard Reingold and John Carroll, and they are such on the well. And, and uh, their persistence there, that they're on a lot, that people respect their views on things, uh, they can break up stupid fights, they can do a lot of things. They can, they can say some issues have you know, 
that's an old argument and it's not very interesting and, and that actually is active. Another way you can deal with that is, for example, on the well there's a, a, a archive conference where topics that became sort of defining for the community, basic horrendous issues that got just hassled out like you know, do, if you own your own words, do you have copyright on them? And if anybody else quotes them somewhere else, should they pay you? Uh, issues like this uh, would get endlessly argued and to some extent not necessarily resolved, but the argument is there. So when a newcomer raises the issue and everyone else is starting to yawn in their face, they can say, actually, you want to see the debate on this, go to the archive conference topic so-and-so, and it's there. I will say that um, I joined the well some time ago, and one of the first incidents I saw was was a suicide by a member, uh, Blair Newman, who sort of did a mass scribble, which means he erased all of his postings on the well the day before uh, he took his life. And I saw eulogies, I saw all kinds of activity, it was, it was unbelievable. And that happened shortly after I, I, I got on the well. And that was a defining moment for the well, and, and that's part of why it was preserved so, so much. And that also, by the way, the, the issue of mass scribble. Mass scribble was uh, one of our users, as they often do, cobbled up a tool. And the tool what allowed you to go to identify all of your previous postings and disappear them with a press of the button. Uh, a really destructive tool. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting because the experience of that kind of power added a whole level of responsibility to the people in the community. In a sense, any one of them could nuke major conversations just by eliminating their own past in that conversation. And so the discussion of that, not only the, the death of that guy and how everybody felt about him and about his death, but also that issue uh, was argued out and it's there and it's part of the community memory. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark Stallman, please. And then I'll start from the front. I wanted to uh, draw our attention to the subject of morality uh, briefly here. Uh, a very interesting book published last year, The Science of Coercion, uh, assembled the data to demonstrate that in 1950, 90 to 95% of all social science in the United States was paid for by the CIA. The research that is done on many of these environments are, uh, are terribly uh, coercive and, to my mind, quite immoral. When uh, uh, Norbert Wiener was asked by Gregory Bateson and Margaret Mead to turn cybernetics into a mechanism of social control. He refused. In fact, it was so important to him that he wrote this in the introduction to the book and then went on to write a second book, The Human Use of Human Beings. Um, he was uh, one of the two uh, most famous uh, mathematicians invented radar and anti-aircraft, so he got away with this. But MIT in particular and Stanford are filled with people um, who didn't refuse and who in fact have been using these technologies or trying to use these technologies for social control and brainwashing purposes over the course of the last 30 years. When um, Jane Jacobs uh, revolutionized uh, city planning with her series of books uh, about neighborhoods, uh, she was uh, put to task about the morality of the neighborhoods that she was creating. And, spent 10 years um, without publishing anything, and just last year uh, published a book called Strategies uh, for Survival, where she addressed these questions of morality. I was first going to ask Bob the question, uh, when I walked in the room, he was completing the sentence, Hollywood has two sides. There's the creative side, and then, uh, and the second half of that sentence, of course, is, and then there's the mafia. Uh, the Hollywood uh, production companies and the creation of culture is a very dirty business uh, in this world in which we live. And I'm wondering if we can somehow jump over that 10-year period. If uh, the, the fellow whose name I can never pronounce who wrote the book Flow, um, Chisanti Mahali, uh, was taken to task, that the experience of Flow is the same um, whether you are writing a symphony or uh, engaged in mass murder. And uh, he then had to write the follow-on book, The Evolving Self, and had to try to address the question of morality. I'm wondering if we can leap over uh, all of this playing around uh, with postmodern immorality and actually address some of the basic moral questions up front before we build these worlds. Uh, we were wondering where you were, Mark. Um, Sherry? Or Bob? I, I, have, a, I have a way of... I don't know an easy way to leapfrog things, but I, 
I just recently did a, a small study of 25 over 21s, in other words, 25 people who are over 21, who consider themselves political activists in cyberspace and who didn't vote in the last election. Um, now, when I say they consider themselves political activists in cyberspace, they're creating democracy on Lambda Mu, they're very involved with the petition system. I mean, I, I don't, I'm, I'm using the term somewhat loosely. Now, this is my interpretation of your question as it impinges on my work. Um, and I think that uh, when I studied, I think some of you in this room actually were people who I interviewed when, I, when nearly 20 years ago I studied the early hobbyist movement, which had there was a real link between the way they saw the computer and a kind of political impulse to make the world a place for more transparent understanding, for more direct politics. I mean, there was a, an exciting link that they saw. And at the time, I worried that this energy, this political energy, uh, this morality, this focus, was being turned into the world of personal computers, you know, would it get to the outside? And now I feel that there is some kind of similar issue for me of a moral nature that I think I try to address in my writing and, how I'm, and in my speaking about this energy, this desire to create new utopian communities and new more democratic forms of, of address and organization. We need it in the RL and how to make sure that we create, I'm, I'm very big on this notion of permeable spaces, how, how to create spaces that both impact on the virtual world and also on the world outside. So that's, how, that's my perspective on the issue that you're raising. Thanks. Bob, did you want to comment on the question at all? I, I don't have an answer, Mark, uh, on that. Um, you know, a lot. Uh, a lot of uh, what I see uh, in terms of uh, today's world um, in, in movies, uh, scripts coming forward, and, and the average price of producing one of these things is, is now about $40 million. Um, and so that the, those who control the productive resources and have the access uh, to capital to not do one movie for $40 million, because you can't, you have to do 20, 40 uh, movies, because you know you're going to have duds. So we land up in our society today having a high concentration of power around the productive assets because uh, you need large institutions to create uh, to create the the product today. Uh, one hope is that um, you know, as we more and more move into the the digital environment and the cost of producing an equivalent product, you know, can be driven down, and so there's a greater distribution of productive assets. And therefore, we can have up on what we call servers today, the kind of product that Carol's going to be making and, and others, and a much more choice uh, for the individual, and so uh, moving a, a democratizing um, what is available and leaving it up to the individual to choose as opposed to what we have right now is I think about 2,400 movie screens in this country um, and uh, about 250 movies. Um, those numbers could change dramatically and therefore open up the door. So I have some optimism. Thanks. Uh, can I say something just oh, really please. quick? I mean, this is just such a key issue for me. I almost hesitate to speak, but um, the the sort of movement I've made in my own career from building computers that turned out to enable a larger population of creators and producer who can create under their own control and produce under their own control so that more voices can be heard led me in fact to the surprising decision to actually become one of those creators, or at least to create a company in which many of those creators could find their voice and would also find their distribution. And I think, you know, what, what we're doing is a very focused effort to create a particular product for kids, and our goals around that are probably much more lofty in the morality sense than I would say in public or would, would believe we can achieve. But on the other hand, um, the technology really is a massive enabler here. And one of the enablers is the hardware. The second enabler is the set of tools that people will create 
We're not creating any, in any way a general set of software tools. We are crea creating precisely those software tools and architecture that allow us to express our vision. But once we do that, they may turn out to be able to express many other people's visions, because there's nothing about the concept of a time and space that means that it's only for kids. And the technology that enables its construction is kid independent. And I think the third thing is the net itself. I mean, many people here think of the net as something that runs at 14.2 or maybe 56 KB. That's entirely transitory. Very soon, the net is going to be ubiquitous enough and the pipes will be fat enough so that not only a small number of, you know, perhaps people in the vanguard like ourselves will believe that it's worth building video to send over the net because that's what the net is able to carry. And having that visual and stereo audio capability being able to be delivered into anyone's house and for that to actually be the website is the power that's ahead of us all and that will enable mass expression, not just mass reception. Um, at the first mic, please. Yeah, Gib Hoxie with the Pacific Group. Two really quick questions, principally for Sherry, I think. Could you share with us uh, a bit about the real people who are behind the virtual characters, planning about not having enough time in, uh, for family and, and personal pursuits in their lives? Uh, who has the time for mudding? Uh, who, how old are they? Uh, what is their partnership or marital status? What's their professional profile? What, and then a second question, if you could follow up on that one. What's the forecast what, for their marital status, no, no, too? No, no. <laughs> uh, what, what, what pursuits are people giving up to pursue mudding? Um, well, the, on the first, that's just such an excellent question. The, the, the first question, the, the, it's changing very rapidly. I mean, I don't want to pretend that when I began a couple of years ago, I didn't feel myself almost exclusively in the company of 18, 19 year olds. I mean, it just felt like that. It no longer does. I mean, there's, there really is a very significant change as more and more people are discovering this. So uh, many are married, uh, older, uh, it's changing. This is an exciting, I mean, I, I haven't seen Carol's product. Do you have it, is it done? Can I play? Can I, I mean, I, I haven't <laughs> seen that, but mud is pretty to see. interesting. Um, and uh, the variety of kinds of muds and the relationships people can have on them and uh, people are drawn to it. Uh, the reason I began with the notion of windows is there's a big uh, misperception of how busy people use muds. They use muds by having them on all the time, creating, I mean, maybe I went a little quickly over that part, creating a character and writing a small program that's a little agent program which beeps you, let's say, when one of your friends comes on the mud. Um, your character is present, it's sleeping. Uh, if you see somebody, you, this agent might beep you when a sort of list of people who you're interested in, you know, one of a list comes on. You wake that character up, uh, you put aside your one, two, three, or your, you know, whatever you're working on, or your simulation of bacterial genetics, or I mean, you, you put aside what you're working on, or your manuscript, and you interact for 5, 10, 15 minutes uh, on your kind of mud coffee break. Um, you leave again, you go to another mud, you go back to your work, you tell people, I mean, th the reason this is, I, I think of this, and I'm, the, the chapter of my, of, my, of my new book that's on mudding is called Parallel Lives. The, the reason I think of it that way is that it's, it really is not an alternate life as much as it is a parallel life that facilitates, that's why I'm so interested in this membrane between the real and the virtual, that facilitates integrating it in some way with your real life. So um, as more and more people d discover that psychological use of MUDs, um, the, the sort of demography changes to people who sit at, com I, I sit at computer screens for a lot of my day and uh, I don't have time on my hands, but the notion of cycling through these different places where you live is part of, people, I think, people's new experience. Mm -hmm. I, I would also offer as an example that y you could, by putting yourself in a particular place, offer information to people outside your office or outside of your, your local environment. So if I put my character in the study hall, that might wind up being some kind of affordance that tells people, hey, don't call, don't send, don't interrupt me right now. If my character is in the cafe drinking a cappuccino, that means I'm hanging, or, or in my laboratory with the door open, 
that may be a very nice way of indicating to others that I'm interruptible and I would enjoy somebody who wants to interact about my work or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. uh, Manny from Microsoft. Yeah, I'm also uh, Manfredo on Lambda Moo, and I wanted to tell Adam <laughs> that it was uh, good for me, too. <laughs> <laughs> Baby! I hear you. Uh, seriously, though. Um, I wanted to ask both Adam and Carol something, which is, I, I honestly believe that creating these virtual environments, especially the Moo-like constructivist ones, is a new medium. And I've been uh, going around talking to uh, book authors or movie people or animators, and I often find that the people who I think are going to be good at doing this are not, that they're uh, too much tied into plot line, or they want to create something which is really impenetrable that people can't change it. And I'm wondering what your opinions are on who you think are going to create these success successful virtual places. Carol? I don't think I can answer because it's a company secret. Um, <laughs> no, not to be totally joking about it, but that's really the hardest question because you need to find people who are, in fact, very talented writers. You then need to take their head apart and put it back together again. And part of taking it apart is um, we have in our company two, two things. One is we have an interactive design team, which is an extraordinary group of people who are principal in taking the writers' heads apart. Um, the second is that we have an engineering team that's built, is, continues to be in the process of building and will be building for some years now, um, something that we internally call the narrative engine. And the narrative engine is a new piece of software technology that in fact is able to execute the deconstructed new, in, new writings of these writers. Or I should say the new writings of these deconstructed writers. I mean, it's very hard. Um, well, first of all, anybody can create a MUD. There are you know, many different programs, you just compile it on a shell account and it's up and running as long as you can get away with the bandwidth considerations at your college. Um, I don't think that you can commission someone to write a great MUD. It, it's an organism that someone starts, it happens, they bring their buddies in, uh, or, or people come in and become their buddies, and it just kind of evolves. Um, you know, the trick is, I guess, is to go out and, you know, find someone who's done a great mud and say, hey, you know, I want to put you under contract. Uh, but it is, it is, I truly believe it's impossible um, to commission someone to say, go write me a great mud, just like the one you did over there. I, I don't think that's possible. Yeah. And, and I would second that by saying we're not building a mud. I mean, we're not just building a graphical mud. It's not a mud at all. It's an entirely new medium. And mm. it's really important to, to note that. Yeah. Uh, by the way, Let's get away from the word new medium and call it new movement. That's, uh, that's it's really a big difference. You know, uh, I, maybe uh, Sherry can back me up. Every 30 years, people uh, get into a whole new vibe. 65, 68, there were, you know, I'm a little bit too young to have really witnessed it, but um, thank God. Um, but <clears throat> was, was it okay? It was great. But I mean, there was, it was a... <laughs> I mean, there was a lot going on. You know, that's, that's when my parents were hanging out and doing really funky stuff. And so now I'm the product of that. And so now 30 years later, you know, we're into a whole new movement. People are doing completely new things. You read every, now it's, the press is starting to come up with saying, hey, this is the revenge of the nerds. Yeah, damn straight. Bob, did you want to comment on that? Well, just to the question in terms of the people you've been talking to, um, the large percentage of people who are in who make product in a linear world um, will not make the transition um, for a variety of reasons. One of them, they're making enough money now and they know they can make it to retirement without worrying about this issue. But there's a class of, of uh, novelist, screenwriter, actor, director who recognizes um, and very deeply that uh, this world is going to be their life. And they don't have a choice. They don't want a choice. They like it. And so these are not the big name people today, other than with a few exceptions. Um, this is a, the new class, and what you're looking for is the new talent. It's like the people that made it from radio to movies, and then from movies to talkies, and, yeah, and, and so on and so forth, with sound pictures. Uh, Rich Miller, if you, if you ask a quick question quickly, uh, we, you will have the last question. I apologize to the rest of you at the mic. All right, the quick question is to Stuart and then to Bob. It seems to me that the whole notion of uh, intelligent agents 
as re relates to navigation of information is really something that you, Stuart, have been involved with for as long as uh, I've been uh, in the Bay Area, which is a long enough time, and that is navigating information for other people. At a certain point, what we really want to do is imbue your taste in information into an, in an, into an intelligent agent and then allow Bob Kavner's CAA to act as your agent to provide your taste to a variety of different people. Doesn't this, whole, doesn't this challenge the whole notion that you can replicate a star? and replicate a star's vision or, or ability to navigate through all of this, uh, this ocean. I suspect this is more a question for Sherry, because we're really talking about a, a good bot, uh, a good AI that has uh, learned, either by being told or by watching, I guess, what the, the selection principles of somebody that other people seem to enjoy, what they get led to by that person. Uh, there are, you can do this, hmm. remember this is such a bottom-up domain that a lot of the leadership comes not from leaders but from conversation amongst a whole lot of people. And so there, again on the well, there's a, a topic in the news conference that everybody goes through of what's happening on the well. And everybody uh, will be passing on tips of cool things that are suddenly turning up in the sex conference or wherever. And that's a, lo a lot of the guidance you actually get, not through personalities that way. Now, it might be interesting to train a bot to pick up the taste of whole conferences like that. Uh, but Sherry should speak to, the, to uh, the likelihood of this happening. Well, there are uh, bots that are being developed that are trainable in that way, that in a sense look over the shoulder of people and do and do perform that kind of that kind of function. Um, I have uh, mixed feelings about their uh, uh, about whether this issue of kind of the I mean you're really talking about sort of a taste and personality, That's right. and um, I have mixed I have mixed feelings as to whether or not you're going to get that or whether I really like Pavel's. Uh, the, the, the Pavel quote about the killer application is people, and I see the transactions really as being a, an extension of that, and that, and that somehow this medium is still going to, uh, this movement is going to allow people to have access to other people's knowledge uh, more directly before we move directly to bots. I think that this notion of a conference that people have together will still feel more appealing. Um, I have no, I have no doubt that that will be more appealing, and that's the short term. But having spent a greater part of the last 10 years thinking about intelligent agents, mm -hmm. one of the issues is, is it saleable? And I believe it probably is. Yeah. The idea of being able to ask a bot with Stuart's approach to things to navigate um, a particular topic on art, because I've just read his, his book on architecture, I mean, that's something I'd, I'd pay yeah. for. And if it's paying for George Will to navigate through baseball, maybe I'd pay for that, but not mm -hmm. as much. I'm afraid we have to wrap up the panel. I wish we could speak all afternoon. Um, I want to thank our panelists for a fascinating time. And now to Esther and Bob Frankenberg. Uh, actually, Jerry, we can speak all afternoon, just one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, that was a great panel. Thanks a lot. It was phenomenal. It's kind of hard to follow, though, going from uh, that level to plumbing. Yeah. <laughs>